The passage that we're going to read includes um, the triumphal entry, and I'm not going to say a lot about that because I like to save it for Palm Sunday. <laughs> um, this passage is probably one of the most frequently preached because every year, what else would you preach on Palm Sunday but this? But I don't want to exclude it just so that we have in our minds the continuity of what Mark's gospel is saying. So. Um, I'm going to start reading in Mark chapter 11, verse 1, but we're going to focus more on the fig tree and the temple as advertised. Mark chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. Just one comment about that. Um, as we you know, look at this time of year, we've been doing a lot of... Um, I don't know, downsizing. Everyone's trying to make their lives a little more simple. It feels like that. We've um, made that a um, kind of a watch word in our society. I, I don't know how successful we are, but a thought just is, are your possessions the things that you hold dear? Maybe your car, since this is a donkey we're talking about, but maybe something else. Are your possessions at Jesus' disposal? Because today, we don't know if Jesus had arranged this prior or if he just knew the heart of this owner. But whatever the case, um, two men, not Jesus, two of his disciples came and just took away a very valuable possession and just on trust, no, no even handshake or piece of paper written down or deposit left or anything, um, the donkey went to Jesus. And I think that when we want to evaluate, so where am I on that scale? Um, think of something that you really love. Like for women, it might be a kitchen gadget. <laughs> something that you really love that you would not lend to your neighbor if they came over and said, do you have one of those? You might think, hmm, I'm not sure that is or something. But um, think of something you dearly love, not a person, I'm talking about stuff now. And think, if the Lord had need of it, would you give it to him? And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now that greeting, that thing that they were shouting, really is a traditional Passover greeting. And Jesus' triumphal entry was right at the beginning of the Passover week. So we have sometimes mistakenly thought they're saying that just special for Jesus. And there was a sense that they were saying it special for Jesus. They were throwing their robes on the dirty road and they were excited. But it is also what people said during Passover, just like we might say Merry Christmas or something this time of year. During that Passover week, um, that was a, a greeting that they used. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, as we look to the next section, I'd like you to watch for something. This is kind of an unusual passage. People have listed it as a um, passage without true understanding. And you know, through Mark so far, Jesus has given lots of little stories and examples of things, trying to help people understand who he was, what his mission was, 
how people should um, perceive him, how people should relate to God. And in this case, um, that's what he's doing again. And we come to a story about a fig tree. Now, I don't think I have ever personally seen a fig tree. So I did a little research on fig trees because I just thought, well, especially this time of year in the store, but pretty much always you can get dried figs that come in little containers and all kind of smushed and wrinkly and inside they're full of seeds. If you're trying to think what a fig is like, it's like that stuff inside a fig bar. You may have actually seen figs growing. I hadn't. But the thing about figs is the little baby figs, when they first come out like buds, precede um, leaves on a tree. Those little buds come out first, just like you might see a maple tree with those little red bud things on it. Well, those come out first before leaves come. And so Jesus, knowing it wasn't the season for figs, so let's say like October or something is a season for your apples, you wouldn't go to the tree expecting to find an apple fully formed and ready for you to pull off and eat in July. You know, you'd think there'd be some little hard, knotty green apples, but they tell you those may give you a bellyache. So Jesus knew what season it was, and he goes up to the fig tree, and, and I'll read that to you. I won't um, push into it, but we'll talk about it a little more. So verse 12, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, speaking to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now think what it must have been like to be one of his disciples. Their life was kind of an up and down thing. They just had this triumphal entry. They've had amazing miracles. Um, they've seen him transfigured on the mountain. Um, it, it, Moses and Elijah appeared there. They've seen him feed people who are hungry, 5,000 one time, 4,000 another. They never know quite what to expect out of Jesus, do they? I mean, they'll think that they know how this is going to go, and then suddenly he surprises them. Well, this is a case similar to that, but also, um, if I, as a very plain, lowly pastor-type leader, do something really silly, Look, if I, I went outside and, and acted like maybe I could find some apples out there growing on a tree and it's December and the snow's around, you might think, wow, is she really with it today or what's wrong with her? You know, that doesn't seem reasonable. And, and what Jesus was doing would have caused his disciples to kind of shake their heads and maybe say, well, Lord, why are you expecting there to be figs? It's not even fig season. We don't see that they um, replied anything. Maybe they were just waiting to see what would happen. But it does say that they heard him say it. And in verse 15, they just went on. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And what really strikes me about this passage is, why were people taking shortcuts through the temple? <laughs> Just carrying things through? I've been in situations in the hospital where there'll be a hall that people love to cut through. And it'll be a hall that really needs to be protected for patient privacy. But try as we might, we cannot get people to stop shortcutting through there. <laughs> you know, you can limit their badge access. You can do whatever you want. They're like people waiting out. Oh, the door's opening. I can get through that way. And it doesn't matter, you know, if we told them there's extra radiation there. You don't want to walk through that area of radiology every single day, every time you want to go through. People love shortcuts. We don't know why people would just carry things through the temple, but this definitely gives us this sense of their respect for the temple, for what it stood for, 
had declined. You know, they were seeing it as a convenience to them. It would be sort of like if we had a, a muddy day or something, and I just thought, wow, I don't want to walk through the mud. I'll just tramp through the church and go that way. And, and I don't do that, even here. And this place is not set up quite like the temple was to have a, a holy, holy place where God's presence just, that was the only place that God told them for sure that his presence would be there at that ark between the wings of the cherubim. It, it was a really special place. And they were fighting tooth and nail to try to get the Romans to leave it alone, to respect it as a holy place. They were um, very much feeling possessive of it, like, don't come in here and bring any of your Roman garbage. They didn't even want coins to go into the temple offering that were Roman coins. That's one reason they were money changers. It wasn't that you didn't necessarily have the right change. It was that they didn't even want a coin that had the Roman emperor's head on it to be used to give as the temple tax. They wanted your coin to get changed outside in the court. And, and then you got to take a a real anointed Jewish coin or something in. So they had one sense of this place is really important, but some of the things they were doing as Jesus observed their behavior showed otherwise. Verse 17 says, and he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. That's a pretty famous statement. Most people have heard that before and kind of said, hmm, about it. Even people who aren't Christians, we use that phrase. Um, King James called it a den of thieves, I believe. And you might wonder, why did Jesus say that? Now, the simple answer that I've had preached to me is absolutely incorrect. It was that the money changers were charging too much extra for the coin so then just like today if i went and tried at any bank if i tried to change my canadian currency because i'd been on vacation here for american they're going to charge me um, for that service unless that's my bank and i already pay them too much money for other stuff anyway so there was that sort of thing but jesus was not calling it that because of that as i read this i sort of pointed out that he began to drive out not just those who sold, but those who bought. One of the types of people, it says, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Now, why were they selling pigeons in the temple? Has anyone tried to catch a pigeon lately? Yeah. Remember when you were a kid? Did you ever actually take a salt shaker out in the yard and, and try? Wasn't it fascinating to think of maybe being able to catch a bird? You know, as a child, birds were just so amazing. I did run around the yard with a salt shaker a lot. I never caught a bird. Now, pigeons are a bit slower and maybe a bit easier to catch. I'm not sure. But women, once a month, had to bring a pigeon as an offering, as a um, ritual cleansing. And it was very convenient and reasonable to have pigeons there for a good price, you know, a quarter or something. And much easier than on your way, to, it's the day to do that for me, and now I have to go catch a pigeon? You know, what am I going to use, a cage? Or how am I going to catch a pigeon? So it was there for a good reason, for convenience, to allow people to be able to get there. But even those people got their tables turned over. And so if you think about this, you realize Jesus is not doing this because they were um, cheating or making too much money, or that would have been too simple of a thing. Just as he said to the fig tree, you've got those beautiful leaves, but no figs. No baby figs, no hope of figs. You're figless. I'm disappointed in you. He's saying the same thing to the people in the temple. He's saying this system that you have to worship God, you're working so hard to have all your ducks in a row, but in your hearts, there's no fruit. 
of you being close to God. Your system is not working. And the way I know it's not working is in this courtyard, which is the court of the Gentiles, that's to be a place where God is shown to all the nations, not just the Jewish people who have special access, but to all the nations. This is where any person who's thinking, who is God? I'd like to know this God can come in and worship you have not shared that with people. Instead, you've taken that space to do your business. You've not shared it with the nations anywhere. If somebody wants to know God, you're holding that tightly and, and special away just for yourselves, and you're not sharing who God is. And this system is coming under judgment today. It will no longer be the case that this is how God is worshiped in the world. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So early on, this is the week Jesus is going to be crucified at the end. Already, he's come to Jerusalem. We talked about that. Probably not the safest place for him to be. He's annoyed every religious official in every single group. Now he goes in and just tips over all the tables and makes a mess in the temple. It's not the first time he's done this. The first Passover, the first year, of Jesus' ministry when they came into the temple. He did the same thing. I never really heard the consequence of that, but they didn't put him in jail or take away his rabbi credentials. They didn't seem to do much of anything. They were kind of puzzled, like, who would do this? Well, he's doing it again, but this time he's just been shown to have the favor of all the common people, all the people who could create a riot or make a mess or get them in trouble with the Romans. And the officials in that temple were concerned. They never wanted to rattle the Romans. They were willing to pay them off a little or give them false compliments or pretend that they really wanted to follow their laws because they knew the fierce kind of meanness of the Romans and that they could take away their temple. They could take away their, their very way of life. They could send them out of Israel. And, and that was dear to them, probably more dear to them than the God they said they were worshiping. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. So within less than 24 hours, we had a green leafy tree totally withered. It would just be like in hot weather if your little tomato plant was sitting out there with no water. I've seen tomato plants just kind of curled up and laying over on the ground and too late to fix them. But this was a whole tree that had been leafed out. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them. Now let's just take a minute and think. Does that mean Peter is prized? Does that mean Peter is giving God glory that what he said to, would happen would happen? He hadn't actually said the tree was going to wither. He'd said, nobody's going to eat figs from you ever again, tree. But the fig tree is withered. And Peter's announcing it as though Jesus maybe wouldn't have noticed if he didn't point it out to him. And Jesus answered him this way. Okay, Peter just said, that fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus says, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Odd answer, don't you think? But it could be as simple as saying, you can do the same thing, Peter. Um, just speak to your problems in faith. Although I'm not really sure the tree was a problem. Um, it isn't as though Jesus had no other source of food. He had 
made food for the thousands of people. As we note in scripture though, he never used that God power in himself to just give himself an easy lunch. Remember when he was fasting in the wilderness and the devil came to him and said, turn these stones into bread, you're hungry, have something to eat. He didn't do that. And I don't see anywhere in scripture that he did do that, but he's saying in a sense, um, this, this system that you have, this temple that I just disrupted the business in, this nation, the way you are worshiping God is going to be totally wiped away and changed. And think about that. That is what's going to happen. When Jesus dies on the cross, will it do any good at all for someone to keep this whole system in place and keep doing all the sacrifices? Remember, the veil is going to be just torn in two, so there'll be no more separation between the Holy of Holies. He's showing them just like the fig tree withered away, gone, it's going to be firewood. Your system of worship, this temple, is going to be gone. Now the Jews had this saying, just like we say silly things now that don't literally mean anything. You know, like we'll say silly things like, there are many ways to skin a cat. Are we really planning on skinning any cats? No, we're not. But we're saying there are a lot of ways to get the job done. Well, they had in their um, national language um, sayings, they would talk about if something's impossible, they would say it, it would be like trying to move a mountain. You can't do that. Well, they're standing very near the Temple Mount when Jesus says this, and he's telling them this temple is as much as gone. Now, that it was a treasure. It was a national treasure. So it'd be like you're having a trip to Washington, D.C., and you're standing in front of the Capitol, or you're standing in front of some building that represents your country to you, and some guy comes in and says, eh, this thing's gone. It's, it, there won't be a stone on top of the other one. And people would think, well, no, we have security for that. We're not going to let that happen. Why are you saying that? It was just as absurd what Jesus was saying. And he'd said that already, and we'll say that again in Mark. But as they were, he was teaching them, he says, verse 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. It was saying, you can have confidence that what you, you speak, if you are following God, Jesus is Lord of your life, what you speak, you can have confidence will happen. And the idea of, of speaking to your problems in faith is not quite the same as praying and saying, God, please help me with this, is it? Now think about it. If I say to this mountain, be removed into the sea, that's not the same as me saying, God, please take this mountain and pick it up and throw it into the sea for me, please. Instead, he's saying to the fig tree, Nobody will ever eat from you again. No people will ever come here and find figs again. And his teaching to Peter, who's saying, wow, the fig tree really did wither. What you said really had effect. He's saying to Peter, you don't understand this yet, but I'm helping you. I'm going to start with this baby step teaching that just like I say to the fig tree, no one will eat figs from you again. If you and your heart feel that your problem is something that's within God's will to say, be gone, say be gone. It's sort of like when Jesus cast out demons from people, he didn't say, oh, 
Heavenly Father, what a mess this kid is in. Please help him to resist this demon or please make that demon go away. Instead, he would say, loose him or go away or be gone. And you might say, well, that's Jesus, fully God, fully man speaking. And that's true. But here he's telling Peter, this is how you do it. Have faith in God. If you speak to this mountain and say, be moved into the sea, it will be so. Now, James has more teaching on this and reminds us that we often, as we are um, trying to move in our faith, we often do doubt. And James says, somebody who doubts, who waves like the, the waves of the sea, if you're looking at them coming into the shore and then think, oh, maybe not, and they go back out, and they come into the shore, oh, maybe not, and they go back out. He's saying that person, a double-minded person who's not really sure they trust in God, they're just thinking, well, let me give this a try. I need some help, and I've heard that some people can pray for things, and it sometimes kind of sort of happens, and I'll, I'll, I'll give that a little try. This is that same kind of thing. The idea of faith, um, it's not like saving faith. God gives us a little bit of faith to trust in him and say, you know, I think you might be who you say you are, God. And he gives us that faith. The Holy Spirit comes to us and draws us to God. He gives us that bit of faith. The faith that I'm talking about is not saving faith. It works the same way when we say, okay, I, I believe that you are who you say you are. You can't be doing that like, oh, I don't know, maybe you are God, maybe you aren't God, but I'm just going to cover all my bases and I'll just go through a few religions and just and say that I believe that way and then I'll be covered when I die and I won't have to worry. It, it can't be like that. You have to put your trust in God for salvation, but if you want to have your problems taken care of by God's power, Jesus is saying, speak to them. And what I hear instead is people saying things like, I don't know, this is really bad, the world's bad, the government's bad, the schools are messing up. How can anything, we're, we're very negatively speaking people. And I'm not saying to take this to some weird extreme and, and, and say, this pew is red. It looks blue to me, but this pew is red, and I'm sticking with that. It's not some ridiculous thing like that. But I'm saying Jesus encouraged Peter to believe that God is who he said he was. And just like he cursed the fig tree to say, if you do that, it's just like a mountain being moved into the sea. And remember, that was just like many ways to skin a cat. Jesus is not telling us to go disrupt the geography of the world by throwing mountains into water. He's saying just like in this picture I'm showing you of the temple, it's going to be no more. The fig tree is a... Um, picture in Old Testament history of the nation of Israel. It's often referred to as a fig tree. And so seeing the fig tree withered and dead is saying the nation of Israel isn't going to function like this anymore because Jesus knew he was coming to die on the cross. He knew that the way was going to be different, that it would no longer be through the high priest going into the Holy of Holies, that it would be he directly with you. Jesus, access to him would not have to have a priest, that we would be able to go directly to him and say, here is my need, here is my sin, I need a savior. Now today, as we think about that fig tree, Think for a minute, what is your fig tree? What is the problem that you have that if you had to pick one, you would say, here's what I really need you to do, God. And I'm just going to encourage you to pray this week about it and say, Lord, show me, guard my mouth. How do I speak about this problem? Am I speaking about it as though it's hopeless, as though it's bad, as though there's no solution that I see? 
or am I speaking about it in a way that says, I'm trusting God for this. I don't know the exact outcome, but I trust God that he does know and that he is the one that is worthy of my trust. He is the one that I'm putting my trust in, his power, not mine, not the system's power, not the medical system's power, not the banking system's power, not the government's power, but he is the one I trust with my fig tree. We're going to sing the um, song at the end of the service, Knowing You, Jesus. And I think the saddest part, when you think of it, if you were one of the 12 and you'd spent three years with Jesus, maybe three and a half, experts kind of differ on that a bit, but let's say three years. You spent three years with Jesus and you still don't really know him. Now, you could say that number is different for you. Maybe you've spent 15 years with Jesus and maybe you feel like you know him better than you ever did and I'm happy for you. But what we don't want to have happen is that we stay these little infantile, struggling messes of people because we never really come to know Jesus, to know his power, to feel confident that when we ask, he will answer.